research and other things going on <laughs> in the front row that I would cultivate before I started. We're busy. Uh -huh. <laughs> so welcome to the College of Architecture and Design at OSM Marquette University. My name is Carl Dobman, and I'm the Dean of the College. First off, welcome to our first lecture of the spring semester. Uh, because these lectures are archived online, it's best practice not to talk about current events, but I'll say that there's a huge snowstorm outside. <laughs> and Polly braved, as many of you did, braved the Michigan winter to be here. So it's great to have you all in person, and I know we also have people joining online. Our college offers degrees in architecture, interiors, product design, transportation design, graphic design, and game design. This multidisciplinary culture creates a vibrancy where we can unite around different types of topics, and the lecture series is often a way that we can do this. Today we're gonna to talk about how research, Anthony's running down, so I think something's wrong. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, this multidisciplinary culture creates a vibrancy where we can unite around different types of topics, where today's topic is on research and how that might support professional practice. We have students from many different disciplines in the room today <clears throat> to hear Upali speak. Welcome to all of you, and welcome to everyone joining online. As we've been waiting, there's been a few slides flashing for upcoming lectures. Kim Yao will be joining us from ARO on February 13th, so mark your calendars, and Carla Diana. I also know that I've got some colleagues from our health sciences programs, and Carla Diana help to develop a robot in nursing. She'll be speaking on February 15th. And so, so many people in the room may also be drawn to Carla's lecture. So now to introduce Dr. Upali Nanda. Upali is Principal and Global Director of Research at HKS. And maybe it's worth saying all of those words again, right? That she is Principal at HKS and Global Director of Research. That's a pretty important title. Uh, HKS is an international architecture firm, and she spearheads and leads research projects globally. She also teaches as Associate Professor of Practice at the Taubman School of Architecture and Urban Planning at U of M, and also serves as Executive Director for the Nonprofit Center for Advanced Design Research and Education. Research is sprinkled throughout all of the, the introduction. Um, research pervades her work, and she's able to position research, making it relevant to the professional world. Her award-winning research around health and well-being, neuroscience and architecture, synesthetics, point of decision design, and other design-driven outcomes has been widely published. She's won numerous research and innovation awards, including the 2018 Women in Architecture Innovation Award. We've had a chance to intersect in a few different things, and I, I like the way that you're saying we need a future play date mm -hmm. to be able to talk about all of these things. Uh, my guess is that she works incredibly hard, but she also finds joy in what she does. We were on a panel recently for the Detroit, Detroit AIA, and I think it was like, Upali, well, why haven't you lectured at LTU yet? And I think we talked about it, and then COVID happened, and then there was a threat that it wasn't going to happen today either with the snow, and she's like, are we still doing this? So finally, Upali is here to lecture to our students and our faculty, and I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Upali. Thank you for joining us today. Good play dates take time to set up. I'll also say that if you're working really hard and not having fun, don't do it. <laughs> Life's too short. Um, thank you so much for having me, Carl. Um, thank you to those of you who braved the snow to come out here. Uh, I'm guessing that 90% of it was because of the pizza, <laughs> but making room for me counts too, thank you. Um, and for those of you online, I appreciate that decision. Um, and for whichever tab I'm on, on your screen, I say hi to all the other tabs. <laughs> um, it's such a pleasure being here, primarily because you have a gorgeous building. 
and I laugh about the fact that not a lot of architecture schools have amazing architecture. So you have a building that has light, and it feels like such a small thing, but it's huge, especially in the winter. So thank you for having me. What I'll talk about today is a perspective on research and practice, uh, very much forged from wearing many, many different hats, uh, which is anchored on the art and science of being human, which has defined my work for many years now. Um, I live a pracademic life. I live mostly in practice. So like Carl said, I'm a partner um, in a large architecture firm. Um, we have a Detroit office, uh, but it's 24 offices worldwide, so it's a pretty large footprint. Some of the projects uh, include like the SoFi Stadium, in LA, some of the large hospital complex buildings that you might see. Um, so we do big, huge projects, right? It's a big firm. Um, I teach part-time at Taubman, um, and like Carl mentioned, um, I volunteer as the executive director for a nonprofit on research and evaluation focused on design research, health and well-being, and human health. Why? Why do I make my life so complicated? Because I truly believe that anything that's worth doing happens at the intersections. And you have to embrace the intersections. It's intersections between fields, it's intersections between practice, academia, and nonprofits. It inter it's intersections between diverse people. But it's always in the intersections that true innovation happens. Um, I'll also share that as of this morning, Carl, um, I just took on a role as Global Sector Director of Innovation, which is brand new, and that is after 10 years of being the Global Practice Director for Research. So to me, it's fascinating, and it's not something I would have ever predicted that I would get a PhD, work in research and practice, take this weird route um, the road less traveled, as we were talking about in our team, and land up as a partner in a firm leading a sector on innovation. And so I'll kind of repeat this message constantly about whatever path you see, leave yourself very agile to other opportunities that come your way, uh, because you'd be surprised. I found it really interesting in in our own profession, how it used to be all about plans and drawings. We talked about footprints all the time. But now we talk about cloud prints. We talk about AI and technology and this complete digital world that sometimes is invisible, but is so impactful. And it's changed our conversation fundamentally. We used to talk about building for the senses. Now we have sensing buildings. Change the conversation. We used to talk about human-centered, and now we are shifting to living-centered because being centered on just being human hasn't gotten as far. And that's why we make that distinction on the art and science of being human, but not always being human-centered. And that's a shift in the way we are thinking, too. We talk a lot about prediction. We have such incredible simulation tools right now. It feels like we are constantly predicting. We talk very little about proof. How did it all work out eventually? We talk very little about the lived experience. We talk a lot about design. We don't talk enough about outcomes. And that is something that will center my talk today and got us down this path of research in practice is a commitment to outcomes. There's a lot of research on something simple like daylight, which we just celebrated in your building, and the impact on energy and health. There's so many articles, so, so many articles. Yet every time we design something, we still have to make the case for light. Like something fundamental like that. The proof's not missing here, but how to make the case is still something we need to work on. Lots on materials, cleanability, ventilation, and pathogen spread, especially post-COVID. A little less on perception of cleanliness and fear. 
And I raise this because I remember thinking how many people would use um, hand sanitizer, even as we kept saying this is airborne, and it's really about ventilation, and it's really about air quality, but the perception of cleanliness came from tangible things, and people kept going towards the things that they could see and touch and feel. You won't find a single field that is not touched by human perception, because how else do we engage with the world? There's a talk that we are working on right now that says climate action is a human perception problem. We just, as a species, have huge amounts of trouble even computing something that will happen in the long term because our fight or flight keeps kicking in. So part of the reason we take such a human-based approach is know yourself, know your biases, know your instruments, and know how to interact with others to make the change you want to make. And that's one of the key reasons. So it's, it's fantastic if you know about materials, cleanability, <coughs> ventilation, we have to, as those that design buildings. But we also know, need to know about perception and how things are perceived and how communication is perceived to make true impact. Uh, one of my very, very early papers prior to joining HKS, actually, was on the impact of art on anxiety medication. And we found that just by having biophilic art, the amount of as-needed anxiety medication prescribed to psychiatric patients in a holding room would reduce. We argue that a hospital would save $30,000 a year on as-needed medication by changing the environment. Think about that for a second. How powerful is that? One piece of art, and here we design entire cities, one piece of art, one change in the environment can have a visible, measurable, tangible, and fiscal outcome. An impact on health, which reduces the use of medication and improves perception. And I remember that being a turning point because I was still like five years out of school at the time. And when I did the study, I didn't expect the results. I didn't have that much faith in the environment. And that changed the way I approached being in practice because I knew it makes a difference. It's just really difficult to measure as the complexity of what you do keeps increasing. So it's not easy to measure as the scope of what you do increases, but never forget the amount of difference small things can make. And so we talk a lot about data today, we really do, and even as a researcher, I will say I get exhausted by it. You can drown in data, you have to stay focused on the delta. What's the difference you're making with it? If you can't answer the question about what difference will you make, don't collect the data. Don't get seduced by the data if you don't know the delta, if you don't know the difference that you're trying to make. And so again, it comes back to linking design to outcomes. And to me, that's the simplest definition of innovation, is how to link design to outcomes in the simplest, most elegant, most creative way. What we design, however, is changing. In our form alone, we do design buildings and physical worlds. We now design digital worlds. We design strategy and operation and experiences. So we've become more and more upstream in architecture firms in terms of what we design. Because we've realized that unless you have strategy, operations, and experience designed, how are you gonna design a building? What are you designing a building for? And that design is no longer contained and built in mortar. This intersection between the physical and the digital, whatever it looks like, it's forming as we speak, is such a beautiful opportunity that we haven't even started unpacking yet. So that's driven a lot of our thinking and our approach to innovation. Innovation has a definition. The most traditional definition is that it has to be a novel idea that can solve a meaningful problem and creates value. It has to get us to some kind of an outcome and impact. And again, for us, it's within, through, and beyond the built environment. And those three words are very important. Within, through, and beyond the built environment. 
The built environment is our anchor. The built environment is something we understand uniquely that we bring to the world. But we have to go within, through, and beyond it because most of the world doesn't understand what the built environment can do. Our agency will never change if we only speak to ourselves. This idea of working on research is a lot about developing unique IP, new ideas, new ways of thinking, new tools. You guys can hear me if I move around, right? And I'm not messing up the online thing, thank you. Um, but those ideas have to get integrated. They have to result in some kind of design within, through, or beyond the built environment that results in impact that then gets influence in the world. And in practice, this spiral is really important to us because oftentimes you can do this part but not do the other parts that get you to impact and eventually influence. How do you think differently? And often with research, especially coming out of healthcare, uh, we think research tells you a way to do things. In reality, it tells you a way to think about things that will question the way you do things so that you can do things differently. I love this, this uh, quote by John Ive. Language is so powerful. If I say I'm gonna design a chair, think how dangerous that is. Because you've just said chair, you have said no to a thousand ideas. Because you've just said chair, you've said no to a thousand ideas. That is why we do research, because we wanna go back to the foundations of what affordances do I need? I need to sit in a comfortable way that makes me feel strong, it makes me feel empowered, it makes me feel like I can do the best work possible when I sit here. Is the solution to that a chair? Maybe, maybe not, but that's the power of design. And research is done so that you can leverage the power of design so you don't go back and do things the way they've been done for decades. And that's the innovation potential. When I joined, this was a quote by Dan Noble, our CEO, research is the lifeblood of innovation. That was the premise of why any company would invest in research. You're a small team, <laughs> Nico can talk to you about that. But you invest in it because you want to get to thinking differently. Some of the things we do, um, for those of you who would maybe apply to HKS someday, is an incubator accelerator program where everyone in the firm is given an opportunity to put forward ideas. Those ideas are given some time to incubate. If those ideas incubate and we think they have legs, they go into an accelerator, and then we see if it can actually be invested in by the firm. And see some of the examples here, Rick. Like it's examples like AI and automation to maximize impact in master planning, to working with the unhoused in Denver, to thinking about hospitality or healthcare planning in different ways. They're very, very practice-based, but they're trying to push the boundary. And I always use this slide for mission critical. Mission critical is one of those typologies that you think would be extremely boring to do. It's just data centers, but may have the most innovation potential for sustainability and automation. If you ever come across a problem where you don't see innovation potential, you're not looking at it right. And that's another thing to always remember. If you're designers, you're always seeing the innovation potential in something. See, so here's an example of the team that's looking at how AI will impact the data center industry and the kind of questions they wanna ask. This is a project that is on housing and affordable housing and how you can really use design elements to get to the kind of impact we want and developing toolkits. But how all of this happens is you first invest in a team of diverse thinkers. In our team, we have expertise in experimental psychology, environmental psychology, public health, sensory design, we actually have someone who has a PhD in creativity who manages the team, if you can imagine that, because she's really trying to see what the creative potential of a team would come back, 
out as we have anthropologists that we work with. Um, I'll call out Nico, who is a Lawrence Tech alum, who we stole from the architectural team right after he got his license. So we have licensed architects who are working at this intersection and getting all these diverse perspectives and tying it to the day-to-day -day of what we do. Because when you do that, the day-to-day -day of what we do fundamentally changes. It's a team that does deep dive applied and coalition-based research. We do applied work because we're in the industry. We do a few deep dives, which are questions that really come from the industry. But we do a lot of coalition-based research. That's why we do have a nonprofit in place, because partnerships is where the fun is. It's integrated in practice, and again, the same idea of within, through, and beyond the built environment. And these are different innovation sector practices. So advisory is where we have our clinicians and strategists and economists. ESG is environmental social governance, where we have our sustainability group. Cities and communities is urban planning and community engagement. Line and futures are our computational design groups that are pushing the boundary for digital and material technology. And supporting all of that is knowledge development, applied design research, and basic research, and that's kind of the structure. So think of what's below as an engine, and what's above as the fuel that's fueling the practice. And for us in research, this is what I started with, is we're anchored on the art and science of being human. We rely on empathy, and we lean on evidence. We study people and their relationships with their environments. You are so lucky to have a class on it. Very few schools of architecture have a class on environment behavior. And it's so important. And we track that all the way from neuroscience, psychology, and anthropology. I sit on the board of an organization called Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture. And I joined that when I was a volunteer and like a fresh grad out of school with with starry eyes, and I thought it would change the world. And 20 years later, I'm still like, we're still trying to prove why understanding human behavior is important. Did we stop being human? Because we haven't figured out how to reach humans. And that's such a cool thing. And I was telling Carl earlier that sometimes we think because we're people, we understand people. Biggest fallacy that's out there. It actually takes a lot of time to understand people design for people and do it in a way that's impactful. So for us, art and the science, both are important. Empathy is important, evidence is important, and the people's relationship with their environments is important. And why do we do it? We do it in a very place-based approach. I bring this back again. Our way of interacting with the world, our superpower is the spatial understanding and understanding the intersection of people, nature, and space. That's our gift. That's our superpower. So the place-based approach is really important, and a lot of our human behavior tools are anchored in space. Uh, some of these have actually been developed by Nico, so if you have questions about the tools, you should ask him. Um, but we've tried to do more and more tools that can go directly into the architectural design process, and get the human layer to the spatial layer so we can talk about it simultaneously. And all of this is so we can unlock new ways of thinking. So if you do all of this, and then you're like, what did you do differently? And you don't get an answer to that, what's the point? You have to unlock a new way of thinking to get to impact, to achieve desired outcomes. So one of the things that's really fun for us to do is, uh, we converted some of our own offices to living labs. Detroit office is actually also a living lab. And we measure environmental impact and health impact on our own offices. That sometimes you don't have access to client sites, so why don't we just measure ourselves? And that's been a lot of fun. And I think we have a latest one now in Atlanta, which is a brain health pilot, and is measuring the impact of the workplace on brain health and cognition. And um, that should be coming out in a few weeks. So let me shift here and say, okay, this sounds really great. It still sounds aspirational. Great that we can do it in the offices. How do you embed it into practice? I'll give you the case study of healthcare, and I'm glad someone from nursing is in the room. Um, in healthcare, 
we have developed this model with some incredible leadership in place to create a core which is based on research methods, then an intersection with practice so we can do applied research and get revenue for it, and then get to coalitions and influence. And we do it in three very distinct ways. We do discovery and diagnostics early. We do prototyping and testing during a project. We measure impact and outcomes after occupancy. Is anyone familiar with the evidence-based design process? Have you heard it? I'm looking for more hands. More hands. <laughs> <laughs> Nods. Um, evidence-based design is basing your design decisions on the best available evidence, primarily used in healthcare. It has a very clear eight-step process. And so that process has been embraced by the healthcare teams and practitioners are trained in that process. And then you'll see some of these tools, like we have a tool called a design diagnostic. You know, have you ever gone to a doctor that talks to you and asks you what the problem is and says, all right, I'll take you at face value? Or do you usually get a blood test, imaging, diagnostics? I mean, that happens, right? But never happens with a building. We actually never go in, somebody says we need a new building, and we're like, okay. Here you go, happy birthday. We don't actually do diagnostics on what is the root problem that they're trying to solve for in a new building. When a hospital decides to do a renovation or a new build, it's a huge investment. It means that their operations, their strategy, the way they think about experience fundamentally will probably change. So whenever we do design, we actually do a design diagnostic, we go in the field, spend some time shadowing nurses, seeing what their day-to-day -day looks like, talking about what they're saying versus what they're actually experiencing, and that's what informs the design. And these, some of these are very empathetic tools, some are very analytical tools. We do behavior mapping, which means we mark what they're doing, where they're doing it, what challenges that they're having, and that informs the design. And the diagnostic, what I love about it now is the researchers no longer do it. We created the tool, now our medical planners do it. And that's a sign of success, is when it goes out of the team and goes into practice with the practitioners who are on the field. There are a lot of literature reviews and state of the evidence that they do, so this is what the research team might do is, everything gets published, journal articles are often written with the sheer purpose of making them inaccessible to a layman's audience, right? It's really sometimes difficult to understand what is this paper telling me? So a lot of what the research team might do is take that complex information, simplify it, synthesize it so practitioners can engage with it. Um, we document a lot of design intent. Why do you think that's important? Why is documenting intent important? You're always intentional. Why is documenting it important? Any guesses? This is for those who have me on a multiple tab open. <laughs> <laughs> intent in, is important because if you haven't document intent, what are you gonna measure outcomes for? It's so easy to post rationalize. It's so easy to go and measure something and say, yeah, that's what I wanted. That's exactly the intent. You actually have to document your intent. Design is a promise, it's a hypothesis. It's something you think is going to happen. If you've documented it, then you can go back and measure, did it work that way, did it not? What can I learn from it? And so sometimes when we do functional performance evaluations or we go back after occupancy to measure, our condition is if you haven't documented intent, we're not gonna measure impact. Intentionality is key to getting to outcomes. A lot of work with simulations and mock-ups. Uh, there's a lot of simulation you can do through VR and AR and mixed reality. But there's a lot of simulation that you can do with just down and dirty rapid prototyping and mock-ups. And people don't always read plans, but they know how they feel in spaces. So that's something that you spend a lot of time doing. A lot of spatial analytics, looking at proximity, integration, et cetera, et cetera. 
and then in the end going back and measuring after occupancy. Uh, for the record, we never say post-occupancy because if it's post-occupancy, everyone's dead. <laughs> so I don't know where that term came from. <laughs> I protest. Uh, <laughs> We call them occupancy evaluations. They should really be continuous occupancy evaluations. You should always be evaluating occupancy because you're always designing for occupancy. Um, there are also a lot of design thinking tools that the team creates. And as of this year, I am so proud of Dr. Wingler and Dr. Joshi, Nico, others in the team, because all of this has become modules for training for practitioners they're all learning it while in practice, and they're implementing it on their projects. That takes time. It takes time to think of something, then get it to the point where the tool is robust, then teach it to the people who are actually doing the design so that it's not some researcher talking about what we should really be doing or designing. And that's been a paradigm shift for us. So I bring up the healthcare model because we've published a lot on healthcare. We do these reports. We have a lot of amazing projects. There's one example I'll show you. But our success this year has been that we are trying to get a lot of us out of a job because it's going straight to practice. Um, this is the project I'll give as a case study. This is ProMedica. Has anyone seen it? Anyone from Toledo in the room? Oh, what's wrong with Toledo? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a project, it was actually the first project I started working on when I joined HKS. Um, Andre, you might have to give me a time check. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, but we did diagnostics in the beginning, including behavior mapping, interviews, focus groups, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what was a lot of fun is we used parametric modeling. So the shadowing that we did, we got data that we called a human script and then we did a parametric model of what it's gonna look like to simulate actual nurse walking, how much they're actually gonna walk. And then we said, if you change the layout, even though we are increasing the square footage, we predicted that we would reduce the walking distance by 55%. Two years after occupancy, we went back, we measured actual distance walked and found we had reduced it by 43%. Not as much as simulated, but close enough. Square footage increased, but walking decreased. Operational benefits were huge because they were now spending more time with the patients. This is difficult to see, it's published, it's online, but you'd also see overall in terms of outcomes, things like HCAP scores increased, like cleanliness, quietness, et cetera. You'll see reduction in noise levels. You'll see overall increase in satisfaction, and they also surpassed all their lead and well goals. What happens when you do this? Clients don't typically pay for this. What is the benefit of going back and closing the loop? Now you can, uh, yeah, please, thank you. I saw a raised hand for those online. <laughs> yes. Absolutely, so two things happen. It improves the next project we will undertake, but for the client, it's immediate improvement on what they could do immediately to actually get the return on the investment they've already made. So it has like a twofer on it, and it's always interesting that clients don't put that clause in. Some projects do, and you know which kind of projects put that? The projects where profit is at risk until you show success based on certain success metrics. Those projects, there's a business model there. Um, it's a contract with, a, with the GC, the architecture firm, and the owner. And in those projects, we are held accountable to our success metrics, but not for a lot of others. But it makes a difference. We learn, the client learns, and in an ideal world, we make new mistakes, but at least we don't repeat our mistakes. And then this goes back to the intent we talked about. Again, very difficult to read. Actually, easier to read up there, sorry. I keep coming to this one. Uh, but you see the design intent, you see the expected outcome, and you say, were we successful, and how did we measure it? 
And one of the things you'll see is we actually call out whether it's a challenge because of the design or it's a challenge because of operations. Have you ever had like the IKEA furniture manual and you need that manual to put things together? Buildings need that too. They need playbooks. They need a way of playing because you've designed it with a certain operational model. If that operational model is not in play, it goes to whack. And I can't tell you how many times we found that out. Again, why if you're going to design, you need to know the people you're designing for, you need to know the business model you're designing for, you need to know the entire system because then your building can do something that gets to overall outcomes. Um, the other thing that's really fun for the healthcare group, I'm totally flexing on them right now, is we do a lot of prototyping, and this is actually an ED pod, an emergency department pod, that they got a patent for, that is getting developed as we speak, that will be inserted into lots of different hospitals. So it's going into the product architecture scale. It's this fun you can have in practice, so much fun. Um, but it all takes time, and it takes investment, and you have to give time for that return to happen from the investments. So again, the mantra is very simple, better design, better outcomes. In this case, the outcome is health, better research, better design. It's not rocket science, but it's really surprising how little we spend on thinking, even though we know it'll get us to outcomes, much better outcomes in the end. All right, I'll spend a few minutes talking about academia and my little love affair with academia. Uh, one of the reasons I teach part-time and decide that this is what my Wednesday evenings are for is, <laughs> is being in practice, it's very easy to sometimes see constraints first. And often in academia, you see possibilities first. And so it's been really interesting to spend some time teaching, moonlighting, and then bringing the real world context to what we can do. So the course is on health by design. Uh, and one of the things that I noticed coming from practice is the sheer amount of brilliant ideas that are born in academia that die on the vine. You could have solved for world peace by now. Like, Every studio is doing something really brilliant. There's this brilliant idea out there, and no one else knows about it. So one of the premise of this class is everything that they do is shared online, it's shared open source, and every cohort that comes looks at the work of the previous cohort and builds a community on it. So still the same idea, this idea of linking design to outcomes, learning how what you can do in design can really change stress, cognitive stimulation, physical activity, et cetera, thinking across the design continuum beyond just architecture itself to the interiors, urban realm, information design, even policy design, and then building a community, which to me is the biggest thing coming from practice because I love the idea that I can say when someone is looking at an idea for in practice, I can say, go here, check out the work that the students are doing. You might think about something in a different way because you forget, because you see the constraints too quickly. So that's been a really, really nice balance to my life is building this community which every year kind of keeps growing. I don't know how the web page gets maintained, but that is not on me. <laughs> but um, it's this idea that there's a community, there's always a community of people who think like you. And if you are interested, there's always a community that is waiting to help. You just need to know how to build those human networks that will get you there. So. That part's been fun. Same idea, linking design to outcomes across the design continuum. But one of the key things we really stress is challenging disciplinary arrogance. It's huge, the amount of friction in our world because we use words that are theirs or ours is huge. 
Sustainability uses certain words. Psychologists use certain words. Architecture theory books use certain words. And we just get mired in these boundaries that keep us from making change. So one of the things about the course is we invite people from medicine, public health, social work, to come and talk about health by design, because then we can challenge the words that we're using and challenge disciplinary arrogance. So that's one of the key tenets. And then the last component of it I will share is how nonprofits get into this equation. Um, through CADRE, what we really try to do is build coalitions. This is the mission for CADRE, advancing design research and evaluation to build a world in which all people have pathways to health and well-being. It's a very simple mission. But everything is open source. Every research report is open source. Um, and one of my favorite projects all time is HKS was asked to design this large live learn campus in UC San Diego. We were given a small amount of money for research, $100,000, which believe me is a small amount of money when you go into the industry. And what we decided was we turned around and created a coalition through CADRE instead of keeping it at the firm. We created a coalition with CADRE and gave that money back to students in UC San Diego who became the researchers for this project. And while they lived in this neighborhood, collected data for what it looks like. Faculty members became advisors. People who could donate time, donated time. People who could donate money, donated money. And the students did the research on the campus that they had built and were living in. It was a great model. You'll kind of see the provost statement here. The college is a living lab that uses architecture to augment positive behaviors and integrates that understanding into current academics and future capital planning. This is the statement from the provost. She said, cool, let's do this. You guys wanna do courses around it? There's now a sustainability course and there's a neuroarchitecture course. So we are measuring the outcomes, we are developing curriculum and students have become ambassadors. And this paper I think will be published soon soonish, something there. And look at the outcomes. This was a longitudinal study. So we studied students in their current environment and then a year later when they moved. And we actually found, despite this being during COVID, that there was an 8.2% reduction in student reported depression. It's pretty cool that the environment can do it. It also exceeded on all of its sustainability targets because you'll see it's primarily a naturally ventilated environment, which you can do in San Diego. And then again, you see some other statistics here about overall satisfaction, et cetera. But what it really did was it built this culture of experimentation where the provost and the academics got interested in the buildings and long after we left, the culture stayed. So I'm gonna go through some of these pretty quickly because I really want us to spend some time talking, but this is just looking at the kind of data we collected. All of this is not from HKS researchers, it's from UC San Diego students. They collected the data, they brought it back to us. Uh, and these are your overall, so you can see the environmental metrics, you can see the human metrics, you can see the overall improvements. And again, intent, design strategies, outcomes. We always come back to that. So I started with saying data doesn't matter, delta does. And I always put these pictures because they don't look like the coffee table books, but that's lived experience. Lived experience is the delta. It's what in the end you know makes a huge difference. And if you want to talk numbers, then the business case is very simple. Design cost, construction cost, even maintenance and building operating cost is a very small percentage of any building's business operating cost. And it's a very small percentage of life operating cost. So if we can do it right, 
Research is a drop in the drop of a bucket to do design right, to get you to the outcomes, to make a difference. So again, that's my perspective, focus on the delta, and this call out that I really believe that the challenges of our times cannot and should not be solved by single individuals or institutions. This is the era of coalitions, and this is why I'm all for playdates, as and when they happen. So thank you for your time, and let's take a few questions. So I have a microphone. We can ask questions, but because I have the microphone, I'll ask the first question and I'll get in a position that, to be able to ask others. I loved your point, design is a promise. Mm -hmm. It's probably even more a legal responsibility. Mm -hmm. One of the maybe threats to some of what you're proposing that I, that I see is firms afraid to share the data because of a fear that they haven't accomplished the promises that they've made and then they'll turn around and be sued for it. So I'm sure yes. you've had to navigate this in the work that you do. Yes, absolutely. And especially, like there's a liability related to the structures and the construction component of it, which is a different type of liability that you share with the contractor. The promise to the lived experience and the operations and the overall outcomes is a promise you share with the operator. And I think the first thing to realize is we worry about getting those outcomes, but we are not solely responsible. We are not responsible for how something is operated, how the experience plays out in it. And we don't think about doing these evaluations in partnership. So I think that's the solution call. Like I think the construction is definitely with the contractor, that's a liability on structures. But on the lived experience side, on the operational and the business outcome side, you share that, you say, this is how we intended it to be used. Are you using it that way? Are you operating it that way? What are the outcomes? Let's get back to what the issue is. And then it doesn't fall on one person or one entity. It falls on how you've actually seen that promise through. But it's a fantastic question, and we struggle with it every day. Other questions? You have to raise hands, people. Once they get started, they won't stop asking questions, but sometimes that. it's a little slow <laughs> to start. And it could be stuff that I presented. It could be stuff that you can, ha you can ask me just about practice in general. It could be a total curveball, which is what my life has been like, and, and I'll pivot as needed, but yeah. Hey, my leg, hold on. I knew this was going to happen. Well, it's for the people online, too, so that they can hear. Are we able to track questions online, too? Yes. Thank you. Um, so really, it's about bringing design, research, and practice as one. And I feel like both on the interior side, on the architectural side, on the research side, the construction side, engineering side, there's always that difference where mm -hmm. design is very We'll just go like, the realist will be like, it's la la land, and then this is the practical, you're so yep. fixed. So there's always that fixed mindset of each discipline, yep. which creates more resistance. And when you're talking about like era of coalition, this is where really it's crossing the boundaries, but everyone is in practice, everyone is very fixed within that. Yep. So I think the thing with you where you kind of bridge and kind of traverse between the two, I think one, that's something that I'm interested in, and especially with these discussions, it kind of opens it up where it makes it available for others to understand, because mm -hmm. everyone kind of really looks like, you're in this box, and you're in this box. Don't step on my box. My laws are, you know, my legality is my contract yep. with this. Your role is this. So and you don't understand me. Box. Yeah, and you know you don't understand understands me. anyone yeah. when everyone's kind of, if everyone is focusing on that simple vision, yeah then you kind of elevate past it. But there's a lot of boxes that everyone sits in. Yep. And that's part of day to day is how do you communicate past a box? I feel like with the very, research and very well back said. in, that kind of keeps that loop going. I think you asked the question and you answered it. Because that's exactly right. I think we put ourselves in boxes and we are not comfortable stepping out of it. That's what I meant by disciplinary arrogance. Sometimes it's also security and protection. Think this is my swim lane. I'm in my swim lane. 
this swim lane's not going where I thought we were going, but I'm in my swim lane. That's very problematic today when the premise of how we are practicing is changing. Like there's so many things, like we didn't even get into the risks with what is happening with technology, who is actually gonna design buildings, who's gonna operate, like there's so many uncertainties right now and we are still focused on this is my box, this is what I'm gonna do and I don't wanna step out of it and you're spot on, that is why it happens and that's why you need to really have a very interdisciplinary perspective and you need to learn the language of the person that you're having the biggest debates with. If you're having it with a contractor, learn their language, learn their constraints. And that's why this art and science of being human comes back again. People communicate in their own languages. You have to become a linguist to go across disciplines. And you have to become a linguist of different disciplines to do that. And I think that is very much what design is all about right now. But that's, that's a fantastic perspective, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Hey, how are you? you you're like everywhere. What is happening? I actually missed my lunch and I was like, I'm attending this lecture. <laughs> Hi. Hello, everyone. I am one of my of Valley's uh, students at uh, the University of Michigan, and I just love her work, and I'm following her everywhere because I love how she speaks about the design. She always like, I, I, I'm really interested in how we, as architects and designers and urban planning and everyone is just um, thinking about you know the practi practical way of you know design, but also the research part. This is always missing. And my question is, uh, I I really loved uh, the idea of the intent and how you start with it within the research that you started at the beginning and um, carry on until you know the the last part of the design and then after the design is built and everything and i was wondering if you communicate that with the owner first the client from the beginning because as always like we don't have uh, i mean uh, you mentioned that not, uh, a lot of projects have the money for the research part right and in my opinion that it's very important to start with the research and know what what's our you know future outcome what we yeah. wanted to do what's our intent so do you think that it's um all the project that you're working on it's um it's good for a research at the beginning? Do you start uh, uh, proposing that to the client from the get going or do you you know, tell them after that or how does the process begin? Very difficult. I so imagine. if I make it sound easy, I find imagine. me later on and I'll tell you what the backstory is. I um, no, honestly, it's more difficult than it should be a reach. Um, it really depends on the typology. So if it's healthcare, right. mm -hmm. they are owner operators. Right. So a lot of times the people who are commissioning the building are the ones who are gonna operate it and they're accountable to the outcomes. So with them, That's it's very tough. easy early on saying, what are your outcomes? It's safety, it's infection control, it's falls, it's satisfaction. Their outcomes are clear. You work with the owner, you commit to the outcomes, you find your way there. Right. If you're doing a developer building, then you are many, many steps removed from the operator and the end user. So they don't have the same incentives. So the other thing, like why I say learn the business, is the business models are different. And when business models are different, incentives are different. When incentives are different, behaviors are different. And again, it'll come back to human behavior. Because you always wanna say, why is this person talking to me that way? What is driving him? What is driving their perspective? And it, it's understanding that and baking it in. The second point I would say is I would love for us to get to a point Product design doesn't think about research as different from design. Human computer interaction, like HCI feels like the design of an app. So much research goes in before you actually design it. Ours is a strange profession where we're like, oh, where's the time for research? It's because of the complexity of what we do and the time within which we do it. It's because we do bespoke solutions it's not like manufacturing where you have to get it right because then it's gonna be manufactured at scale. We do it and, and I think sometimes it's like, didn't get this right in this building, I'll fix it on the next one. Right? We, we have that ability in some ways. So we need our way of making the case for what is the right amount of resources because we are resource constrained. 
We do very, very complex things. We're the only profession where you're designing things all the way from a faucet to the whole master plan. And so we need our way into research and design, which no other paradigm fits, and that's part of what we've been trying to figure out. So you, you always start with what's the difference you're trying to make? What's the delta? What's the right amount of time to spend on those questions? How do you do it wisely? And how do you do it within the resources that you have? And then you don't think about what's a line item for research, a line item for design. You're really just driven by impact. But learning the language is very important. Learning the business is really important. And good to see you. Doris. As I make my way down, I know there's also a question online. There was a question about the ability or the, the experience of patients being hmm. involved in the design process when it comes to healthcare. If you could talk about that. So, so vital. There are a lot of, most healthcare organizations have patient advocacy groups. So the patient voice is really important, becomes a big part of it, especially when you're doing things like cancer care, for example. Like you really, you cannot presume. When we use the term empathy, I'm always very careful about saying you can never be totally empathetic. You need to just show a desire to understand and get the people who do understand to have a voice on the table. So you'll start seeing more and more the shift towards co-design, where we bring the stakeholders to the table to design with us rather than designing for them. And that's a shift we are seeing overall in the industry. It's a great question. Uh, I'm, I'm going to add to that in bringing those stakeholders uh, to the table. You're also educating them. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times they ask for things that, uh, I don't want to use the word impossible, but maybe impractical. Yep. Because we're coming all from a different culture background. So what I want to, to say here, a lot of uh, what you're speaking of, I definitely agree with. But it's also a mindset. Mm -hmm. So if you remember when uh, AIA said, you know what, we're not going to participate in building prison. Okay? Yep. But we still have to make that bottom line. So how long did that you know, stay out until people realize, hey, you know, we have mortgages. We got to do this, do that, right? So I see it as a long journey and changing, slowing down so that we can properly do the research. Yes. And get the right materials, healthy materials in the building as they are being developed now. So, I Absolutely. No, and I think to Doris's point, it's all happening at multiple levels, right? There is this basic research that's happening that is being published in robust journals that's building an evidence base that is helping us make the argument for very foundational things. At the same time, there's applied research that is moving very, very quickly and contextually applying that research with the right stakeholders in the right way. And a big part of that is being agile without compromising quality of work and rigor. I, I think that's, that's a very key message, so I thank you for bringing that up. I can hear him. Thank you. Um, I am wondering about how you establish metrics for design intent. Um, specifically, I'm looking at the lighting, you know, side of the world. Um, are, can you speak to how your design and research have led to differences that maybe you know, standard practices would lead us to uh, different conclusions. So we all know, you know, we need X number of foot candles on a table, but how do your designs? How does the design research other, come up? Yeah, how, how do you come up with other metrics than foot candles on a surface? So there's one question about metrics and one question about unexpected outcomes, like unexpected yeah. insights, right? I think metrics, we tend to use three brackets overall, one is environmental, one is human, and one is business. It goes to the triple bottom line overall, so environmental metrics is your predicted energy use, your actual energy use, air quality, all the stuff that is really linked to sustainability metrics, and environmental quality. 
those tend to be things you can objectively measure. Then you have the human metrics that are a little more tricky, and those might be around human satisfaction, self-reported data, observed data, data that you can actually get from secondhand, so you're actually observing behaviors, and that's an ent another entire category of data. And then there's the business case, the profit-related data, which is on time, on budget, on schedule, the amount of revenue that you're bringing, the amount of footfall that you're getting, the number of people who are coming in. So those are the metrics, right? And depending on what kind of project you're doing, the relevant metrics that matter are different. And we actually have a process that's called metrics that matter. What are the outcomes for those outcomes? What are the metrics that matter? Right? Uh, your second question is unexpected findings. And I'm gonna take UC San Diego as an example, where everything was designed with perfect amounts of daylight and it was naturally ventilated. There was a lot of simulation done for daylight. We have such amazing daylight simulation tools. You know what the unexpected finding was? It was around privacy at night because campuses are 24 seven and the kind of blinds we use to optimize daylight did not work for student privacy at night. Such a tiny thing, right? And it changed their standards for blinds, and we never think about the night when you do all the simulation on daylight. Um, so that was a very unexpected one. To just piggyback on that, what, uh, for the blind situation, what did you guys find would work better? Did you <sighs> dive into that? We did, and at that point, the UC San Diego facilities team did, and we actually got a collaborator for Carnegie Mellon um, involved. She's doing some really interesting research on blinds being the blind spot on daylighting, uh, because you're right, like you do all of these amazing windows and it all comes down to blinds and the kind of systems you're using for operations. Uh, so the exact specifications, if you follow up with me, I'll let you know, but that re literally revealed the blind spot to us because we were looking at the lived experience 24 seven. <laughs> yeah, all pun intended. <laughs> and I think we're at time, so I don't know how you wanna, I'm good. But I know people have classes, or you don't. Oh my God, that's such a beautiful question, thank you. Um, I think you're right. I think that the use of the term elegance is very, uh, it's, it's perception based, and it actually depends on who you're speaking to. So an elegant outcome when we're speaking to the CEO of a healthcare system is very different from an elegant outcome that when you're talking to the owner of a sports stadium, or a community park, or an affordable housing, and that's where that perception plays in. You're like, what's the outcome that matters? And how do you communicate it in a way that really connects with them and is elegant to them? Um, so that, that's a great point. We were just talking about a simulation recently, which was around uh, a smart home for FDA, which was supposed to be for affordable housing. And Nico and I were discussing, saying, this looks, this looks too expensive for them to actually feel a relatability that this is for them, like you're, you're, it's beautiful, but it's not elegant for them because it doesn't really connect with them. Um, so I think that again, like, that's why we keep talking about this, really dig into what it means to be human and dig into what it means to be human on the other side of whoever you're working with or working for. I feel like I should stop here. I couldn't say anything after that call. <laughs> like, I <laughs> think. I, I have one. Okay. Sure. You're an exception. No, I'm <laughs> now, now I have to top that answer. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier, just because we're people, we may not understand people, which I think is uh, a great concept and things that we talk about in our human behavior class. Just this morning, Elon Musk was in the news because he supposedly has successfully implanted a chip in a human brain and the whole idea that um, 
people with disabilities may be able to overcome those disabilities, mm. which I think is awesome. But I'm also curious because that is related to an app which is created by <coughs> humans and then that whole realm of free will and thinking on your own and all that just almost scares mm -hmm. me when you look at it. Any, th any research been in on this yet? You know, or? The, I am so relieved that the field of ethics mm -hmm. is coming along very strongly alongside AI, yeah. hugely. And I will say that when we started investing in AI internally, the first thing we did was create an ethical framework for it mm -hmm. and say, okay, what data are we gonna share? What data are we gonna absorb? What are our rules around it? Because ethics is key. And these come down to basic human morality kind of questions, which again, your generation has to deal with in unprecedented ways. So I don't know if we have time to unravel that string of the sweater we'll, we'll <laughs> just at this moment, that, okay. but I think it's, it's, very, like, it's that very small, take the field of behavioral economics. Behavioral economics is based on the entire field of marketing having a very nuanced understanding of human perception then nudging you to make the decisions. <laughs> Till the time that you're nudging me to make decisions that are good for my health, it feels right. When, when you start nudging me to make decisions that spend more and more money, and you're actually manipulating me, you start getting into these really fuzzy boundaries. Uh, so once you have an understanding, responsible use of that understanding is very important. So I do appreciate you bringing that question. I do appreciate that this is something we all have to think about all the time. And again, it's a really interesting time because technology and humans are like phew, it has merged, and more psychologists and anthropologists are hired by technology companies now than ever before. Because what it is trying to unlock is the human mind. That is still what we are trying to simulate. That's still what we are trying to understand. So if we don't dig into that understanding ourselves, we're doing ourselves a disfavor. Can I say thank you now? I was gonna start <laughs> by thanking you, first of all. I also, I'm I don't think we can blame today on the pizza. Mm -hmm. oh. We have people from outside the institution here. We have people from practice. We have students from product design. We have students from interiors. We have students from architecture. We have colleagues from across campus. And so it's so nice to hear many of the things that we say repeated in an even more eloquent way today. The gaps and boundaries between disciplines and the opportunities that we have here within the college and, and at LTU. So I want to first thank all of you for coming today. It's great to have a packed auditorium, and it seems rare that we can accomplish that these days <laughs> with a lecture series. So thank you all for coming. I hope to see you at the next one. And please help me thanking Upali for being here today. Of your duty now. So much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>